All right, we're going to go ahead and work one more example of finding the zero input response of a discrete time, linear time invariant system. In this example, we will be working with a difference equation that has complex roots. So these complex valued roots are going to come in a single complex conjugate pair in this particular example. One thing to note in this little sequence that we've done where we had distinct roots and then we had repeated roots and then we had complex roots is that when you work with difference equation, it doesn't have to be just those cases. You could have a difference equation that's higher order that has several distinct roots and maybe it has a second order repeated root and then maybe two pairs of complex conjugate roots. So they can come in any combination. These videos just kind of talk through when you have a certain collection of roots, how do you handle them? And then uh, if you have a higher order system, yeah, you might have to deal with all these cases simultaneously, but we're just sticking to the simple case where you have one or the other just to kind of keep the algebra simple. So we're not having to solve for, you know, five or six or seven unknowns. We're only solving for, you know, just a, a few unknowns towards the end. So anyway, here's the uh, discrete time system that we'll be working with. Again, we wrote it using the kind of the advanced operator notation, our E symbol right here. That is the uh, polynomial Q of E right here. So we know how to find the zero input response. We need to know the initial conditions of the system because that's what the zero input response is due to. It's due to some initial conditions and how those evolve over time. And to find that zero input response, the key thing that we need to know is the characteristic equation, which I can find by taking Q of E and replacing the E's with gammas and then setting that characteristic um, polynomial equal to zero. So I've set it equal to zero and I now have the characteristic equation. If you use your calculator to figure out the roots of this second order polynomial or use the quadratic equation, it's pretty easy to figure out that we have these complex conjugate pairs of solutions for this particular case. So one of the roots is when gamma is 0.65 minus j 0.49, that's that root, and the other one is when gamma is 0.65 plus j 0.49. So I think of it as 0.65 plus or minus j 0.49. One, um, one thing that's kind of nice to do sometimes when dealing with these complex conjugate roots is to write it in polar notation. So if you take the magnitude of the roots, you get 0 0.0, I'm sorry, 0 0.814, and then an angle of 0.646 radians. And we're gonna need this uh, polar form of that here as we work forward. For our complex conjugate roots, we know the form of the zero input response. We're gonna write it as this damped cosine. So it's a cosine with some frequency denoted by beta with some angle denoted by theta. And then there's an unknown constant C. And then the damping factor is actually the magnitude of the root raised to the K. So this is the form that we're gonna guess. And now it's our job to figure out what the C and the gamma and the beta and the theta are so we can plug into this equation and know what that equation is. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and do that. First, I'm just gonna write down the uh, form of the equation again so we have it here on this slide to reference. And then let's go ahead and compute some of these quantities. First of all, what is the magnitude of gamma? So that's the magnitude of the roots. The magnitude of the root is equal to this quantity right here, because that's what we found for, as the polar form of our root. And that's why I like to write it in polar form, because when you write it in polar form, it's really easy to see the magnitude. The magnitude of e to the j anything is 1. So this just turns into the magnitude of 0 .8, 0 0.814, which is 0.814. So finding the magnitude of gamma is fairly straightforward if you've been able to write it in polar form. Then what about beta? Beta we defined as the angle of the root. So if I take the angle of this complex quantity, again, polar form is nice because I can just look and see what the angle is. It's right there. This is 0.646. That's just the definition of the angle of some complex quantity. All right, so we know some of these values. We now know that we have 0.814 magnitude to the K, and we've been able to solve for beta. What about the other two unknowns, the unknown C? and the unknown theta. Those are the two unknowns that we need to solve for due to the initial conditions of the system. So let's go ahead and talk about the initial conditions. One of the ones that we, was give, we were given was at time k equals minus one. So I can come to this equation right here and replace all the k's with a negative one, which I've done. 
and set that equal to the value we were given for our signal at time minus 1. And the value that we were given in the problem statement was the value 2. So I now have this equation right here. 2 equals this kind of mess at the moment, right? And I need to do the exact same thing for the another initial condition. The other initial condition was k equal negative 2. At that time, we were told that our signal was equal to 1. So I set 1 equal, and then I replace all the k's here with k equal to negative 2. So if I do that, I get this equation right here. So now really the trick is, how am I going to solve for c and theta? One trick that you're going to almost always have to do is theta is kind of stuck inside the argument of the cosine here. If we use a trig identity, we can get that kind of pulled outside, so to speak, and it'll be easier to do the work that we need to do. The trig identity that I'm going to use, this is the cosine of a sum of things. So there's a trig identity cosine of alpha plus beta that lets us write that as cosine alpha times cosine beta minus sine alpha times sine beta. So if we use that trig identity on this right here, I can rewrite this equation as the following. So cosine of 0.646, because remember the cosine of a negative quantity is just cosine of that quantity because cosine is an even function. And then I have cosine theta. And then the sine of a negative quantity is negative the sine. So I had negative, negative made this a positive value right here. Remember, sine is an odd function. And then I have sine of theta. So I've used that trig identity to kind of expand that equation into this form. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing on the second equation. Let's apply this tri trig identity to this cosine of alpha plus beta. If I do that, I get this right here. So using the exact same thought process, I can write this next term as follows. All right, so we're getting there. Let me go ahead and just start multiplying some of these things out. I can ev actually evaluate that and that and that and that in my calculator, right? Just plug those into your calculator. Just make sure you're in radians because these are radian quantities. And then also 0.814 and 0.663, those are just numbers. So if I plug some of these quantities in my calculator and kind of multiply things out, I can simplify this first equation like this. So this has simplified to this. And for the second equation, plug those into your calculator and you can simplify it to this right here. So we're getting there. It's a little tedious. And I'm obviously skipping some of the, uh, you know, plugging to my calculator and things, but that's not really the point of this video. Let's keep going. So let me just recopy those equations from the previous chart right there. And then let's go ahead and multiply out and kind of distribute the C. So I'm just distributing the multiplication to get rid of the parentheses. And now this is my new set of equations right here. So here's the kind of the final trick to solving for these unknowns C and theta. Because I still have the problem that theta is kind of inside the cosine. It's kind of inside the sine. It's kind of, it's not isolated as kind of a linear coefficient, which is what we normally want. So here's the final trick. What I'm going to do is I am going to think of C cosine of theta and C sine of theta as X and Y. Because look at that. I have an X here, and I also have an X here, and I have a Y here and a Y here. So if I just define C cosine theta as X and C sine theta as Y, I can rewrite my system of equations as this. And now this is a nice linear constant coefficient system of equations that I need to solve. This just looks like normal high school math now, right? So if you go ahead and solve for x and y using whatever approach you prefer, you should get 1.937 for x, and you should get 0.135 for y. Now, remember, we defined x as c cosine theta, and we also defined y as c sine theta. So now I have this simplified system of equations, and now I can easily solve for c and theta. So the final trick now is let's take the ratio of c sine theta to c cosine theta. So I've done that right here. If you do that, obviously the c's cancel, and sine theta over cosine theta is just tangent theta. So I have tangent theta equals this divided by this, because that's what c sine theta over c cosine theta is. So now I have 0.135 over 1.937, and I, I just take the inverse tangent of both sides. I can isolate theta finally and figure out that it is 
0.0696 radians. And once I have this value, I can go back up to either one of these equations, plug in theta, and solve for c. And if I do that, I get c is equal to 1.942. So we finally solve for c and theta. So the essence of this problem follows many of the same steps that we had for the previous videos in terms of using initial conditions. The only difficulty here comes in the fact that when we're dealing with this damped cosine term, the theta is kind of buried inside and it required us to use some trig identities and kind of this trick where we defined x and y so we can actually end up solving for theta. But once you kind of know the trick, you know how to approach these problems in general. So now that we know our unknowns, we can go ahead and write down our final answer for the zero input response of this particular system, which had a single pair of complex conjugate roots. All right, that is it for now. That wraps up this little short series on three cases of solving for the zero input response. In our next video, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about the impulse response of a system. The impulse response is a very important quantity that lets us characterize the output of a system for any input using something called convolution. So uh, keep watching if you want to learn about the impulse response and figure out how to solve for the impulse response given a difference equation um, as we've been working with in these videos.